Who am I? What am I? Certainly an interesting question. But strangely enough, we don't ask ourselves this question that often. Am I the same I as when I was a child? And will I be the same in the future? Am I my body or do I have a body? Well, I am not my body because few of the cells are the same as when I was young. So the body is very different from when I was a child. And on the other hand, I am still myself or not. Is myself the sum of thinking, feeling, experiencing, intuition maybe, willing, memory? Or am I awareness? Am I consciousness? Or do I have a consciousness? Or is the universal love or the universal life conscious? in me is that universal consciousness conceivable by myself or do I see myself as ego as a self-centered being a self-sustaining force fighting for my own existence or am I myself a being capable of identifying with others and with the other in me. An inscription on the temple of Apollo at Delphi reads, know thyself. We could say that self-knowledge is an important starting point for the inner process of self-initiation. For this presentation, we would like to introduce the idea of the two selves. As you might recall from previous presentations, man is a two-fold being. There is the eternal part, the microcosm, that we would call the self with capital letters, and there is the time-spatial part that we call the self with lowercase letters. Both selves have several aspects that we can distinguish. Self-knowledge is about being aware of both aspects of your being. And there is much to discover. Here we see a schematic representation of what we want to discuss today. To start with the self in lowercase letters, the time spatial part of man, this self can be divided in two aspects. The higher self, sometimes referred to as auric being, and we will talk about this later, and the lower self, sometimes referred to as personality being. And we want to emphasize here again that the higher self mentioned here is certainly not the same as the self with capital letters, the microcosmic self. Now the lower self is in itself a sevenfold being personality being. You are probably more or less familiar with the four bodies. Very brief overview. The etheric body is the life-giving body, the energy field that keeps our physical body alive. And there's the astral body or desire body. It is a subtle field of energy of our emotions and desires. And there is the mental body that could be understood as the energy field of our thinking. And then we can also discover a threefold consciousness, thinking, feeling, and willing. We could say that the thinking 
consciousness is based in our head sanctuary, our emotional consciousness in our heart sanctuary, and our willing in the pelvic sanctuary. It is the consciousness of our lower self, the consciousness that says, I. Now there is a connection between the mortal personality self and the immortal microcosmic self, with the capital letters. We could call that the ability to identify with an aspect of our duality. This is a capability to be aware of oneself and that can identify completely with the personality or rather with the microcosm. We could call that principle the soul or in the context of today's presentation, the self with just a capital S the force in the middle. We could describe the process of self-initiation as a shift in this awareness, a shift in consciousness from the time spatial part of our selves to the eternal part. And this representation of the carriage and the driver can clarify this image. In our current state of being, the personality self is in the lead. The soul principle, the driver is not steering, but following the self-centered aspect. Now self-knowledge and self-initiation is to become aware, to be the eternal one. So that our microcosmic self takes back control of our being to grow from self-consciousness to world-consciousness. So going back to what Bob presented as the ego, what we call the ego, the self-focus or self-maintenance, a status quo maintenance. This ego has two aspects. The lower self, what we usually call the ego, the free folding soulment of the mortal personality, which keeps us in matter here and now, and what some call the higher self, the auric being, with the de within our damaged microcosm with all its karma inheritance. This is the orientation of our microcosm towards self-maintenance and the origin of what we know uh, as and what is called the fall. The lower self the ego, the lower ego, is trying to control life through the self-continuation and finds meaning through examining the physical world outside and the inside of our own being. Looking at our mortal personality as source of knowledge and understanding. So we investigate our physical aspects and we are all aware of so many selfies taken nowadays, or we focus on intellectual knowledge, looking at culture, science, or emotionally looking for love and friendship on the horizontal level, or even through religious fervor. The higher self, or the auric being that we mentioned before, is pushing the lower self towards using so-called occult hidden knowledge for self-maintenance and is trying to get to know our eternal being, our microcosm, and its lives in the reflection sphere. We call the reflection sphere the life of the microcosm after death, 
where our eternal being, the damaged microcosm, is so-called naked, so without the personality being, but it's still in its damaged form and with all the inheritance of karma of previous lives. In this direction, spiritism, channeling, astrology, or occult forms of philosophy are used to make a connection with the after-death world. Both of these forms of knowledge are not liberating. They keep us imprisoned within the world of here, space and time, and the world of the beyond, the world after death, which we call the reflection sphere, where there are also entities who try to preserve themselves, feeding from astral energies of the living. So the wheel of life and death is maintained. So back to who am I? Who is the knower? What kind of knowledge are we speaking about today? Can we know ourselves when looking with the same eyes? the eyes of the personality, the lower self, or even the higher self? Or can we know ourselves when looking from the perspective of the damaged and burdened with karma microcosm? Can we see the full picture from within our closed system? Can we pull ourselves out of the marsh by pulling on our own hair? The universal teachings speak about the only point of connection to the divine light, what we call the spirit spark. And after going through many lives, many incarnations and experiences, the state of our auric being, the higher self, allows for a new personality incarnated and linked to it to seek a true meaning of life and finally realize and open to the existence of this divine spark inside and so focus our attention on it. The light can now ignite a pre-remembrance. So a process may begin to unfold dependent on the degree of focus and effort. This process may unfold as follows. This insight into the futility of life inside the pit opens us to the touch of the light, leading to a yearning, a new desire, a yearning for liberation. The spirit spark enlightens and sparks this new desire to go back to our original home. The observer is thus awakened. This observer is the awakened part of our being who uses the light to focus its attention and investigate the self, thus gaining more insight and opening the possibility of what we call self-surrender, the surrender of the ego, of the I, of the personality to this process. And a purification of our vehicles will ensue and enable a transformation of our way of life. 
a new way of life will begin that will give more insight and thus propagate a spiral of transformation which can lead finally to transfiguration and liberation. It is, we could call it maybe like a process of positive feedback and intensification, like in a three dimension spiral. In all the world's great religions, the idea is expressed that, well, in the beginning, human beings had a perfect connection with their origin, with the absolute, with God. And when they lost this connection, they became twofold creatures, as we tried to explain at the beginning of this presentation. So twofold creatures separated from God no longer able to live in the original light world. And the original teachings describe then a path, a path of return to the light world, a method of restoring the connection with the Godhead. And this means from knowing yourself to overcoming yourself. And we have to underline that a spiritual path needs to be distinguished from a religious path or from belonging simply by birth, by family, by culture, by nationality to a particular religion. And in addition to that, it is about self-initiation. So no gurus or authorities, but self-authority. And what about the Golden Rosy Cross? And here we would like to read to you uh, an extract from the elementary philosophy of the modern Rosy Cross by Jan van Reichenborg, one of the founders of the modern school of initiation. And he writes, the spiritual school of the Golden Rosy Cross does not posit a popular faith, but a clear and positive knowledge not in the sense of collecting facts, dogmas, phrases, theses, hypotheses, and so on, that ultimately leave man empty-handed, but knowledge in the sense of comprehending, discerning, and inner possession, which is irresistible and absolute. So it is a matter of grasping with our hearts and to link the two sanctuaries to be able to think with the heart. And today the Golden Rosy Cross is, as we said at the beginning, active in more than 50 countries with city and conference centres where this all takes place. And the subject is that of initiation. And on the left, you see a phrase which I would change to say, if you do not die before you die, you will die when you die. Now, how do we decipher that? How do we understand that? It means entering into eternity now, during our life. And as we've tried to explain also, it is the feeling and perceiving the other one, this force of the spirit spark which is in us. And to do that, it means decreasing and allowing. And if we refer here to the Christian uh, story and the epic in the New Testament, it is John who recognizes Jesus in the desert of his being, and he agrees to decrease to allow for Jesus, that new force of the spirit spark, to grow. As we said, this is a process of self-initiation. So it is one rung after the other. 
but we shouldn't see it in any hierarchical form of a ladder but more so in terms of a spiral form. And it is said, know yourself and you'll know the gods. And this comes through purification, transformation and transcendence or transfiguration. And linking that to the New Testament story we mentioned before, it is then the Jesus being in new consciousness that meets the Christ being the macrocosmic force of the universe. So moving from self-consciousness to world consciousness. And when we were preparing this talk, uh, one of our friends said, well, it's moving away from cleverness into wonderment. And the condition for the process of transfiguration is that the processes of change take place where? In the body, by a consistent and proven new mode of life in willing, thinking, feeling and action. The necessary change will really take shape and the influences coming from the heart can then spread through the whole system. And this is why the Golden Rosy Cross emphasizes the fact that the path of transfiguration can only begin here in the now, on this side of the veil of death. So in the life field of matter, because on the other side, we lack a physical body and the complete fourfold personality we presented is needed as a serving factor as a servant in this process. The body fulfills an important function in this process of rebirth, but cannot accomplish anything of itself. Because as it is said, the mortal cannot inherit immortality. So the person who follows the path of gnosis and devotes himself to it will gain a new soul. And with this, a new personality the limits of space and time to which the old consciousness was bound, then lose their meaning. And here we have a text we would like to share with you. Become conscious of your emotions, your thoughts, the workings of your will. Whatever your conclusion, do not force a counteraction with emotions, thoughts or will, only observe objectively. It is essential to obtain self-knowledge. Try to descend into the sources of the subconsciousness. See yourself as if standing on a balance. Note the positive and the negative, the subjective as well as the objective. Let the truth breathe through you and be still in great peace. So this means self-observation, but in a group, a community of sharing and mutual support because like attracts like. It is to discover the truth in oneself. And in one of the books of Jan van Reichenborg, the De Gloria Intacta, he describes the results of this mode of life. If the pupil is only able to maintain the neutralization of his desires long enough, so rejecting all metaphysical and philosophical speculations, the freedom of his thinking faculty will be gradually restored although still within the confines of structural bondage. The thinking faculty is set free from the chaos of inclinations, education and blood. It is now up to the pupil to courageously fight the inclination and blood instincts ever trying to draw him back into his old life. So we see the words liberation and oneness. 
And in the Egyptian archgnosis, Jan van Reichenborg says, so now you can see how God can take hold of the whole system of the nature of death within you and bring it to rebirth so that the temporal is swallowed up in the eternal. The natural figure belongs to the world of time. It is subject to time, but the soul figure is subject to heavenly forces and therefore stands in eternity. So time is dissolved in eternity and death is overcome through the manifestation of the new soul body. Any attempt at liberation, no matter how great it might be, if it does not take into consideration the necessity of dissolving the ego, it is condemned to failure. 